So 10 days ago, we had the good news, we, we had your results. But what I want to get a sense from you here is the conversation, the bywords in the corridors around here is about transition. Transition to electrification, you just come off the podium talking about it. My question is this, is big oil running too quickly to the exit of big oil? Is there just too much of a focus on transition? No, I don't think so. It's all about a balance. And we're certainly investing the majority of our capital in what we do well today and transitioning over time. This is, uh, this is going to be a slow transition. There's going to be a need for oil and gas, all forms of energy, 2 billion people more on the planet by 2040, huge growth in Asia, Africa, uh, just for electric power alone. So, no, we need to be prudent, be involved. We know a lot about these new technologies. They have to be economic for our shareholders. So you, you, you're going to see all of it coming. And, and I read with interest what you're doing. You're doing, I suppose, and forgive me if I paraphrase here, you're doing smaller deals, specialist deals. You're not blowing the bank mm -hmm. on a $2 billion deal like Shell. You're choosing projects in a very different way, a different way to Lord John Brown. Mm -hmm. What Shell may be doing is right. Actually, we can't afford to do that right now, given our financial framework. We did invest nearly $10 billion in renewables back in the late 90s and the 2000s. It was ahead of its time. Uh, why was it ahead of its time? I think, actually, the company expected policies and markets to develop differently, and government, government uh, making that happen. It was too early. Now we're going back. We kept all the expertise. We're going to go wide, make sure we understand all the different technologies that are out there, venture, partner, and at the right point, the right time, we can make bigger bets. Now, can I challenge that slightly? Because mm. the proposition from the market would be, is why, why would I pick up BP mm. stock when I can go buy a utility in solar, I can buy a utility in water. Why, why should I risk that with you? Because there's a really uh, great natural combination of renewables and natural gas. So we're investing, we best, invested in a, in a great solar development company here called LightSource in the UK. So how does that fit? Well, we, we take that company, work with them in places like Oman, Trinidad, Algeria, Egypt, where we combine making the electrons for the local power grids, and then we send the natural gas molecules down the pipeline for other use. And it's a good economic model. It's good for the country. Uh, there is this natural combination. And it also happens with wind. Then the proposition is this. Tom Keane ran the number before I came down here. Just make sure I got it right. 6.3% mm. is your average utility return over 10 years. Tom was irked. Mm. So his proposition to you is this, is that you're trading like a utility. Your responsibility as a CEO is to up the dividend, to up the bid, and, and turn yourself into a much more behemoth of a pair again. I know you're still paying the cost of, of crises in years gone mm. by. What do you say to that? What do you say to that proposition that that's the discount you're under at the moment? Well, it's a healthy dividend. We're not the only ones with that level of dividend in the industry. We're coming off a period of very high, low, high prices and then a complete collapse in, in the energy mm. prices for a while. Um, we have, as an industry, have had experience of overspending, being late with big projects. We need the confidence back of our investors. Last year, when we went out and did our strategy presentations in February 2017, the investors said, we really like your strategy. We just don't believe you. And it wasn't personal, and it wasn't only about BP. They said, oil companies, just, you're spending too much capital. Stick to your discipline, develop your projects on time and under budget, and then you'll attract more investments. And I think that's what's happening now. Is part of that critique, part of that questioning from the institutional shareholders, the risk is that you end up with stranded assets. This is the phrase that's used. But how do you manage that back? How do you go back to the shareholders and go, I'm absolutely confident this time around, you said it in that hall, it's different. How do you reassure the investor roster that this time there's no risk or the risk is mitigated on stranded assets? Well, stranded, there's always been stranded assets in, in, in all the industry, but you take a company like BP, we have we turn over our entire production every 13 years, roughly, reserves to production. We turn over the balance sheet every 10 years. So people say you get stranded for 40 or 50 years. Actually, while we're, we don't turn on a dime, we actually can turn over the whole company in, in response to market conditions. So I'm not worried about the stranded assets. We try to make investments today, which we know will have uh, economic long lives for a long time. If you're in the low part of the cost curve, whether it's natural gas or oil, 
it's decades. And you're squeezing those costs lower again. Mm -hmm. where, where are we at with you at the moment? We're about fifty, we're about 50 bucks in, 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 terms, in terms of your costs? We're about $50. We've got some of the obligations from the Gulf of Mexico still in there. But by 2021, we'll be in the $35 to $40 range, I can say confidently, in terms of our break-even points. So here we are. We're, we're, we're back. I was with Ian Taylor a couple of weeks ago. Ian, Ian was bullish. Uh -huh. he, he was up in the 70s. You were in the studio just a couple of weeks ago. Your world changes constantly. Mm -hmm. Where Where is the bandwidth? I don't want to... You can give me a price of oil if you want to, but mm -hmm. where's the bandwidth for you? Is it 50 double nickel? Is it 40 to 50? Where do you see the longer term trajectory, given the challenges from the U.S. as an exporter? I think the key is the responsiveness of the shales. And to me, they're a shock absorber on the upside and the low side of the oil price. Right, because it's such a responsive market in North America. For, for, I think in terms of 50 to 65 is probably the band that we will drift within to the end of the decade. You and Ian can have a hedge together. Ian can buy the calls and you can write some puts. Um, you have a very specialist knowledge. The toxicity between the United States of America mm -hmm. and Russia, in my opinion, my humble opinion, is hitting new levels. You have a substantial holding in Rosneft. Mm -hmm. You have a substantial knowledge of this. Square this away from me, because are the risks rising of your holding in Rosneft? How do you look at the geopolitical landscape right now? Well, obviously, we work within the boundaries of the sanctions all the time, yes. just a given. I do think we have a role there. We have a business, a successful business. I do think we have a role there. I think business builds bridges, and I think the more bridges that can be built between countries and the U.S. and Russia and communication channels, I think that's, that's healthy. I think the world needs more of that. But we've got to be careful, but we have very good partners in Rosneft. It's a very commercial enterprise, and we are partners with them there and other places outside of Russia. Can I ask you, if Donald Trump, I mean, he was in Davos, if, if, if he invited you into lunch, he said, Bob, I am trying to wrestle with the geopolitic of Russia. From a businessman's angle, what would be the advice that you would give to Trump about how best to deal with this situation? Well, it, it feels like it's been taken over in the media and politics. It's probably hard for him to deal with it. So I think uh, just, I think anything that can be done to create some discussion somewhere between governments is always healthy, but I probably don't have good advice for him, because like you say, almost any uh, discussion of it raises all kinds of uh, response. The Russian Arctic is somewhere where many people have sort of said, look, this is going to be multi-billions of investments. Put the geopolitics aside just, just for a moment. Let's mm -hmm. deal with the pure old nuts and bolts of mm -hmm. business. Yeah. To, to what extent is the Russian Arctic still somewhere that you want to push for, that you want to be present in? It's got a future, I think, in the energy mix of the future. I think it's higher cost oil by definition, so it's not where we're focusing. Peak oil of peak oil. I mean, that's, that's the chatter. I was sitting with, with the energy team before we came over, and they said, ask mm. Bob, are we, have we hit peak of peak oil, peak chatter? <laughs> I mean, there's, no, there's more peaks in there that you can mm. throw a hairy stick at, but yeah. where, where are we with that debate? Well, it was, it was, uh, it was peak oil, meaning, uh, you know, it's going to go, to, you know, we're going to run out of oil, and now it's peak demand. I think... I think, actually, it's overdone. People trying to pick a date here, you know, with, with the two billion people on the planet coming, all forms of energy are going to be needed. The exact point at which we peak in oil, I think is, quite frankly, I think is out there. We're good, today going to release our projections out to 2040. And then when it does get there, it will, you know, kind of be a gradual plateau for a long time.